you, Colonel. We have an announcement from uh, Elder Carmona. Hello, church. Happy Sabbath. Well, I am pleased to report, if you take a look in your bulletin, you can see that we have gotten a third, a third in one Sabbath of our goal to the Steps to Christ project already. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. I would like to encourage you guys, for those that missed last Sabbath, I want to give you just a quick, quick synopsis. We are looking to give the book Steps to Christ to 10,000, over, over 10,000 homes here in Kernersville. We are raising funds. Our goal is 7,500 or so. We are a third of the way there. So I will encourage you. Next Sabbath, we're going to come and give you some more testimonies. People are giving these things by hand. We're getting people in various shops. People are interested. And in fact, I can give maybe a very brief, um, our the people that Ursula and I are studying with, we have a few Bible study contacts. One of them actually gave us a book and said, this is an interesting read. And the, you know what? It was the book Steps to Christ. <laughs> have you been given Steps to the Christ by a person you're studying the Bible with? I'm studying with them, and they're giving me the book Steps to Christ. So we're going to go on Monday. We're gonna, that's the next time we're meeting with her, and we're going to be like, that was a great read. I don't know where you that was a That was a great book. So praise the Lord. Um, for those that are interested in providing towards this cause, um, just write on your tithe envelope um, Steps to Christ Project, and we will make sure the funds get filtered specifically there. As well, for those that are giving online, um, you can just go on online, and you can just fill out in the local church area, Steps to Christ Project. It'll all go to the same place. Thank you. And God bless. So how many of you have been given a bulletin? Raise your bulletin high. Great. Now, it was given to you for a reason. That means you open it up and you read it. There are a lot of information in your bulletin today. I will just highlight a few things. How many of you know about Barbara O'Neill? Well, in your bulletin, there's a handout. On the back of the handout will be information about Barbara O'Neill. She will be in town beginning on Monday, October 18th at the Uni Unity United Methodist Church in Thomasville. It's sponsored by the Thomasville Seventh-day Adventist Church. So she'll be here Monday all the way through Sabbath. And there are some very important topics that she'll be covering. True cause of disease, conquering cancer, natural remedies, detoxification, diabetes can be conquered, balancing hormones. I, I really need that one. Um, I had a panic attack on Monday that was really severe because of hormones. So I need to know how to control that. Um, there are so many different things that you can learn. So I suggest you take a look through and try to go by and see her beginning on Monday. Also, the Carolina Conference Youth Rally, November 5th through the 6th, will be at Mount Pisgah Academy. That too is in your bulletin. For further information, just take a closer look so you'll be able to get the information that you need. Our health department has uh, also posted a handout on mental preparation. It's a really good piece of reading. I suggest you read it. It talks about mental health. And let me say, mental health doesn't mean you're crazy. It just means that you have an issue. That's all. Because I'm mentally unstable myself. <laughs> just to make you all feel good. <laughs> but please read it. Um, it's, it's a good read. Also, food boxes. Your, your uh, paperwork will be due to Pat Dodson on sub Saturday, September the 20th. And the boxes will be given out on the 21st on Sunday. It's the Thanksgiving food boxes, so please, if you have a family you'd like to recommend, or if you need something yourself, the uh, registration forms are out front on the table. Just grab one and fill it out and turn it in. 
uh, Elder Carmona talked about the uh, Steps to Christ project and our Christmas program, uh, Sister Livia Liga is asking all choir members to attend choir practice for the Christmas program beginning September, October the 23rd, on Sabbath, October the 23rd, immediately after church services. So if you feel you can sing, or you know you can sing, or you think you can sing, just go by and see Sister Liga, and she'll tell you if you can sing, okay? Now, happy Sabbath, church. Oh, Pearl, why do they do this to me on Sabbath? Happy Sabbath, church. Happy Sabbath, church. Thank you. Well, it is a privilege and an honor for us to be here today. We didn't have to wake up this morning, did we? But God saw it fit to open our eyes. He gave us a beautiful present this morning. And for those of you who are at home, unable to be here, we say happy Sabbath. We are not a place where we say we have visitors, because we don't. Everyone who walks into those two doors are a family member. So as I always say, there is no place like anywhere near. So this must be. You don't sound like this is the place. So um, and you should see some of your faces. You're like this. Why are we here? It's Sabbath. Are you not happy about Sabbath? I am. So there's no place like anywhere near this. So this must be happy Sabbath church. Morning, church. On our prayer list today, we have Noel Atchabarra, uh, friend of Ralph's, Lawrence Oliver, Steve Olson, friend of Steve Olson's, Richard Kelly, a friend of Pearl's, Joy Snyder, a friend of Pearl's, uh, and her brother Jeff, Cherie Freeman, and Bruce Freeman. There's a possibility that they're fighting COVID lift them for you. Elsa Morellis, friend, and John Stokes. This is a time when we get together and lay all our burdens before the Lord. You may be down to your last paycheck with no solution. Each sunrise seems to bring fresh reasons for fear. They are talking layoff at work, slowdowns in the economy, flare-ups in the Middle East, turnovers at headquarters, downturns in the stock market, upswings in the global warming, shootouts in our towns and neighborhoods, some demented dictator collecting warheads, a strain of coronavirus is boarding flights out of China. The plague of our day, coronavirus, begins with the word terror. But Jesus doesn't want you to live in a state of fear, nor do you. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you can hide. His truth will be your, be your shield and protection. You will not fear a danger by night or an hour during the day. Jesus says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Isaiah 43, 2 and 3. And Charles Spurgeon penned these words, Day dawns after night, showers display the drought, and spring and summer follow the winter. Then have hope, hope forever, for God will not fail you. This morning as we seek the Lord in prayer, I invite any of you that would like to come down to feel free to come forward. If you do not, you want to bow your head or kneel where you're at, whatever makes you comfortable, whatever makes you feel close to the Lord. This is what you want you to do. We'll have prayer down front here. If anybody wants to join me, 
Please be well. Father, as I look at our bulletin this morning, and as Halcyon told us to look at it, I counted 28 people that are listed on that bulletin for prayer, besides the ones that I've brought before you this morning. And Father, we just ask that you put your arms around each and every one of them and bless them and hold them tight in your arms. You are the creator of all things. This is the hour when we find rest and understanding of things unseen. We turn aside from the matters of work, troubles that we may be experiencing, and take hold of eternal realities. We are not content with our eyes fastened on low things, but would lift our eyes into the hills from which comes our help. Thank you, our Father, who in your holy world created this day of rest, that we may return away from our daily toil and earthly strivings and glorify you. You have led us safely through another week, and we offer you our praise, though we often live a life as though we have no appreciation of spiritual things. Yet you know that our deepest yearnings are toward you. Though we have often failed, you have never failed us. Accept our thanksgiving for all we have yet all that you have done for us. Though you already know our weaknesses and the uncertainty of our hearts, please forgive us for our many sins. Help us, our Father, to put away jealous suspicion, quarrels, and pride, that we may live with joy in effective Christian service. We, we bring before you our pastor today, our elders, our Sabbath school teachers, and all who help us in our walk with you. Help them to be sound in judgment and in knowledge of the word that all may be blessed and will have the will to do the work you have set before us. And please again remember the sick in our church, the 28 that I mentioned and the ones that we mentioned up front this morning. Bless our pastor who has dedicated his life to you, who has taken time out of his retirement to help us in our walk with you. Our hearts are open, Lord, before you. Fill them with your grace that we may not fail to attain the heavenly home promised for the people of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It's now time for our songs of praise, and I need help this morning because last weekend I was under the weather, and my voice might make it through one song. I don't know. Um, so I need to hear you, all of you, sing. And we do have old songs, but they're oldies but goodies, okay? They have a message. Right. When you're singing, listen to the words. Don't listen to a beat or whatever. Sometimes you, you know, can do that, but listen to the words. They've got young people out here. I know when I was young and little, you know, when you get scared, where do you run to? You run to your daddy's arms, your mommy's arms, where you feel safe and secure, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when you get older, like us, where do we run to? Mom and dad. Mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> we still have mom and dad. I have my mom and my Uncle Philip. But sometimes we just have to be sheltered in the arms of God, don't we? 
he's the only one that can take care of the bigger problems that we have as we become adults. Amen. So join us in singing Sheltered in the Arms of God.
Jesus, I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day. Take the name of Jesus with you. can take a part, even the one online. Um, while you're pondering about your giving this morning, I just want to share some thoughts with you. Isn't our world changing quickly? You hear what uh, Dave was reading to us this morning? It seems like every day there's something new to talk about. In fact, 
I haven't seen my coworkers in about 18 months. We Skype and talk through um, Microsoft Teams. But we haven't seen each other face to face because most of us don't usually turn our camera on. But the favorite conversation for Icebreaker is about current events, the state of the country. And so we shouldn't be surprised though, right? Jesus has given us um, the prediction of what's going to come. None of this is surprising. In fact, it's almost like giving us a, an answer sheet. Would not be nice to have an answer sheet when you go to the final exam. But uh, in the feeding of the 5,000, in Matthew 14, verses 8, 17 and 18, there are very two powerful texts that I'd like to share with you now. 17 says, they said to him, we only have five loaves and two fish. And he said to them in verse 18, bring them to me, bring them to me. Now can you see the thoughts or the faces or imagine the thoughts that are going through the disciples at this point? They're looking over at the crowd, even this crowd, maybe 120, and they're looking at what they have, five loaves, two fish, Something's wrong here. I'm not that great at math, but this doesn't add up. In fact, one plus one plus one is equal to one in Pastor Ferguson's math. <laughs> God's math is not the same as ours, is it? He didn't ask the disciple to do the amazing, to do the miracles. He just asked them to bring it to him. So today, everybody, just bring it to him. Whatever it is, he's not asking you to do the amazing. He's ask, not asking you to do the miracles. Let him do that for you. Shall we bow our heads? Oh, Lord God, we love you, Lord, and we thank you for your blessings. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to serve you in our givings. We pray that you will lift us and lead us, guide us in that today. In Jesus' name, amen.
children's story. And it's time for the offering. They've got baskets in the back. If you guys want to go get a basket, there's all kinds of adults just waiting to hand you money to put in this wagon up here. Walk slow so they have a chance to get it out of their wallet. Any up, guys. Oh, and you guys, be sure to go down the sides, too. There are people everywhere in this church, not just down the middle aisle. So a couple of you come up the sides. You might be surprised how well you'll do. Don't give up. Just smile really big. There's some over here on this end. Oh, don't give up yet. We still got at least two or three dollar bills laying on this pew. She's out. But you did good. All right, give him back your basket. And I need you to sit down because I got something really interesting to tell you. Oh, no, I want you to sit down over here. Well, we're going to talk about that man so you can get him to join you. Yeah, we're going to talk about that man. All right. Well, you can sit with your mommy. You'll hear from there. You just won't be able to see the pictures, but it's okay. All right. It's been a long time as, since Miss Pearl's, well, it's been a long time since I have told a story in front of children. I'm sure that Mr. Hudgens would tell you that I tell stories every day as we go down the road. For all of you that do not know, this is my husband over here, Mr. Jeff. Some of you have had him in Sabbath school class. And our story today is about, you're going to have to sit still. You can't be wrestling up front because I can't tell the story. i got to have your attention. Thank you. So, Mr. Jeff had a problem. It was a different truck, but you'll get the idea. Do you know what this is? It... It's, it's, it, it's the front of a truck, isn't it? And this particular part is called the grill on the front of the truck. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's sad. Yeah, so that's right. We got room for you, too. Just come on in and sit down, girlfriend. So you see this grill. It's all nice and clean, right? Well, in the springtime, we have birds in Car North Carolina. And you know what they're called? They're called Carolina wrens, and they're little tiny birds. But you know, when God said to multiply and replenish the earth, they took it serious. And they put their nest anywhere they can find. And what they like to do is go in between these and just fly right in there and put their nest. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not a safe place. And we had trouble with some wrens doing that. They do it to Mr. Hudgens sometimes in the spring. So, you know, he got a little desperate. And he stuffed cloths in there. But, you know, birds, they can just get into any little old corner. And they can fly underneath and climb in. Do you want to see the picture too? You're like, just come up here to the middle and we'll let you see. There it is. Right there's a spot for you. Well, 
Now this is not how it was in our truck, but just to give you an idea of how adventurous they get, this one here is in the wheel well. Now what you think is going to happen when it goes down the road? It's going to hit it and the little eggs are going to fall right out and they're going to crush to the ground and we won't have any baby friends. And that's a sad thing. What would you say? That's right, they get free food. Well, somebody does, the road does, maybe the snakes. Then, this is another one that got inventive, and it actually made a nest. That's right, you've got to come up. There's a little more room right over here, and you can see the pictures. It actually made a nest in somebody's grill. So these guys get real inventive. They just go anywhere. And you know what was that? What? Say that one more time. Yes, that's what happens if the egg falls. It gets cracked open and smushed on the ground, and that's sad. And this is a couple more. Well, this is one that make you're going to miss it, but I guess I can show you up front. See, this is one that did it on top of the car, and this is one that got in the engine. And that was what Mr. Hudgens was worried about because he really didn't want us to start out the road on a lockout, and all of a sudden have a fire or something. So what he would do is he would reach in there and he would take out that nest and they would just build it the next day. And so, like I said, he put the rags in and they just went right up under and built it again. He had to take it out. And this happened for days. He would take it out, they would put it back. Sometimes they do it twice a day. He even moved the truck to two or three different places. He took it down to Priscilla's yard. He took it over to the other side. And they still found it and put a nest in it. So finally he decided this was just a little bit beyond him. And I don't know if your mommies and daddies have read you this promise or not, but if you look in Matthew 7, you know what it says? It says... Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. So Mr. Hutchins decided that this is beyond him, and it's about time he asked his Heavenly Father for some help. Because you know what? God can talk to birds. There may be some people that can do it, but Mr. Hutchins and I don't know how other than just to look at them. So he just, you know, he said, Lord, he said, I need your help. He said, these poor birds... He says, it's frustrating to me, and these poor birds have got to be exhausted. They work so hard to build this nest, and then I come and I just take it out. And this is not fair to them. Could you please talk to these birds and tell them they need to put this nest somewhere else if they're going to have baby wrens? Thank you, Lord. Amen. Well, guess what happened? He got up the next morning and there wasn't a nest in his truck. We didn't have any more nests the rest of the summer. So I guess, well, no, I don't guess. I know God hears our prayers and he answers our prayers. And I know because of this story that God's true to his promises. And you know what else? I know that he loves you guys. He loves you guys more than your mommy and daddy do, if you can believe it. He gave you to your mommy and daddies to raise because he knew they were the best people for you and you were the best people for them. And I'm looking for my last Bible verse that's over here. It says, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow. That means they don't plant gardens. They don't reap. That means they don't plow up the stuff. And they don't have barns to store their food in. Yet, God, their Heavenly Father, feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? Well, let me tell you, to God, you are more valuable. And I want you to remember that. I don't want you to be afraid to ask. Just remember, Mr. Jeff asked God to talk to the birds for him, and he did it for the birds and for Mr. Jeff. And he'll do the same for you. Let's pray together. Have to be real quiet. 
Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for each individual that is here today. Lord, we pray that we will help you to trust us. We pray, I mean, that we will help, that you will help us <laughs> to trust you. And Lord, we ask that you will be with each one of these children. Remind them that they can pray to you. And just like you answered, Mr. Jeff, you will answer them. You care. We ask that you would give each one of us a good week and that you would be with all the people that are sick and hurting and the people that are planning for the things that we're going to be able to do in this church next year. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. You can go back to your seats. Thank you for coming up and joining me today. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is found in 2 Peter 1, 7 through 10. And it says, To Goodland's brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these, for if these things are yours and abound, abound you will be neither barren nor fruit, unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For even who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has gone f forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more, delighting to make your call an election. Sure, if you do these things, you will never stumble. In our scripture reading today, we actually have a recipe. Do you like recipes? Depends on what you're going to eat, huh? So I came home the other evening from, from here, I guess, right? Yeah. And uh, this is what was on the table. Sharon had used a recipe to my benefit. And it was delicious. We'd had this before, but every time she makes it, she seems to tweak it. You know, does anybody here cook? My hands down. <laughs> yeah, so you know about recipes. And as you make them time and again, they just get better because you adjust them to your taste. What we have here in Second Peter, that Gail just read to us, is a recipe for Christian growth. I mean, you know, you add this to it. I say, what's in this? Oh, you add this and that and the other thing, and you do this to it and that, and, and would you like to see this recipe? Second Peter 1, verses 5 through 7, eight ingredients. You can count them, eight ingredients, starting with faith. Well, I'm, going to, I'm going to put them on the screen in just a moment, are the ingredients for the recipe of Christian growth. This is the book Sharon got the, um, initially got it out of. What's the name of that book, honey? Ask Sharon afterwards. She's got a number of names for it here. But this is the Berry Nice Cream Cake. That's what we enjoyed. And it's too, print's too small. Anyhow, Sharon has made her own version of it two cups of frozen raspberries, and you add to that a half a cup of soy milk, and you add to that a half a cup of dates, medjool dates to be exact, a fourth cup of monk fruit. Love that monk fruit. I'm a diabetic, so it helps. Good sweetener for diabetics. And then continuing with the uh, recipe, this is for the crust, which is about two inches thick. And uh, this is all taken out of the freezer, but it's still creamy. It's really good. Two cups of raw cashews, and you add to that two cups of raw bananas, and you add to that one cup of monk fruit sweetener, and you add to that one cup of medjool dates, and um, half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and a fourth cup of soy milk, unsweetened. John, you're going to have to try that. John likes to cook, I know. Anybody else here likes to cook? 
Yeah. So talk to Sharon if you're interested in it, or maybe I can just uh, get a copy of this and put it in the lobby sometime. Here it is, 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7. A recipe for Christian growth. Add to your faith. See, there it is. You add to your faith. You start off with faith. You had to have faith. Faith is the foundation of the Christian walk. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Faith is where we start. Add to faith virtue if you're going to grow. And if you're not going to grow, you're going to lose your faith. Have you ever heard that term before? He lost his faith. She lost her faith. We must grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can never stand still. That's Ephesians 3, I think, verse 9. Grow. This is said a number of ways in the Bible. God tries to reach us this way, that way, the other way, for this most central important thing. Be like Jesus. This is my, this is my song. Be like Jesus all day long. That's the bottom line of what it's all about. This, these are the virtues of Jesus. And he wants to live his life in us. Someone wrote in Christ, uh, Object Lessons, I think it is, on page 69, that the Lord is going to do something to the characters of God's people before he returns a special work. And what does that mean? Does that mean that we're going to have to wear suspenders and go around and get after everybody for what they're not eating or what they should be eating? Is that it? No! We're becoming more Christ-like. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so this is what it means to be Christ-like. These are all the characteristics of Christ's uh, virtues and his character. Add to faith virtue. And to virtue, count them there. They're all in blue. Faith, virtue, and after virtue. You add to virtue knowledge, and you add to knowledge temperance, and you add to temperance patience, and, and you add to patience godliness, and you add to godliness brotherly kindness. The greatest argument in favor of Christianity is what? A loving, lovable Christian. That's it. It's a bottom line. Brotherly kindness. You know what it's like to be around someone that's so gracious. You go to their home and they say, oh, sit here. Take the best seat in the house. And they cut that piece of pie or whatever. Here, take the largest piece. They're just gracious. You first. See? Brotherly kindness. We need that, don't we? And to brotherly kindness add what? Love. That's the cherry on the cake, you might say. Because there's nothing greater than love. That's it. Nothing greater than love. And you say, which is the most important here? They're all important. You can't have one without the other. They all go together. You take one away and it destroys the recipe. And this is what God will do in you. This is what he wants to do in me. 2 Peter 1, write it down, verses 5 through 7. It's in your bulletin. You can read it in your Bible. 2 Peter 1, 7 through 10, so you get the context. Now, in 2 Peter 1, we're staying right here in 2 Peter. 2 Peter 1, verse 10, just after he has said, at the end of this recipe, he says, if you do these things, what things is he talking about when he says these things? Huh? What's he talking about? I mean, he's just given you the things. He's just given us the things. If you do these things, and you can't do them unless Christ is in you. So, you know, as the little song says, it's so true. Into my heart, into my heart. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. What's the second verse? Out of my heart, out of my heart. When Jesus is in, we will shine out. This is what Peter is saying. So Christ in us will do something within us that can be seen from without of us. 2 Peter 1, verse 10, if you do these things, those eight ingredients, and God will put them in us if we will allow him, you will, what does it say? Never fall. This is the secret of victory, a victorious life. If Christ is in me, is the hope of glory. Because he is in me, the devil's out. Now those little songs we teach the children are, you know, Satan makes my heart all black with sin. Jesus makes it right when he comes in. It's true, isn't it? Christ comes in, crowds sin out. 
That's the gospel. If you do these things, these eight things, he will put in you, you will, well, that's a tall order, isn't it? You will never, he doesn't say, what, you'll be better? No, he said, you will never, that's a superlative. I've had some teachers in school that have told me, Charles, you tend to exaggerate. Will you please be, you know, just calm down on the, uh, on the superlatives. As I was growing up, everything was bigger and better and all this stuff. And uh, is that true, Sharon? Yeah, she, yeah. Peter uses, does that here. You will never fall as long as Jesus is in your heart. And, you know, what's that song? Live out thy life within me, O Jesus, King of kings. That's it. This is what we're talking about. We sing about it. We study about it. But you turn to the end of 2 Peter, only three chapters. The end of 2 Peter, the last couple of verses, Peter says, beware lest you fall. He's given a lot of counsel and advice. And at the very end of this letter, he says, beware lest you fall. Well, how can we keep from falling? We have just seen earlier, if you do these things, you will what? never fall. And now he's reminding, if you do these things, he's talking about these graces that God will put in us if we will just open our heart and let Jesus have complete sway in our life. We will never fall. Fall from what? Well, in the King James Version, it says, from your steadfastness. Is that a word anyone's used this week? Not me. I had to look it up. What in the world does this mean? It means from your secure Christian position. When you're accepted into Jesus Christ, he totally accepts you. You are standing with Jesus. You are saved by grace and you are seen in the Father's eyes as if you had never fallen. I praise God for that. That is a secure position to be standing, isn't it? To know that everything's right between my soul and my Savior. There's no rooms that are locked for my Savior. Everything's swung wide open for him. Into my heart, into my heart. Stay in my heart. Go to every room, every corner. Clean it out, Lord. Beware lest you fall from your secure position, safe in the arms of Jesus. Beware. That's why I use that sign there. <laughs> I saw it and I said, Hey, that'd be good for this sermon. What's happening there? We've had to put signs up at churches before I pastored to warn people, you know, step up when you walk into the entrance, what have you. It's a warning he's giving. Warning, is it possible to fall after you've accepted Jesus? Is it possible to lose what you had? Yes, it is. Enough of this once saved, always saved stuff. It's not biblical. And Peter right here reminds us that we can get what we want and lose what we had in Christ. So watch out. We must grow in the grace and knowledge of, I'm going to, it's not a slide for this, but it must be said. We must grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But never will that growth deny the former growth. Do you understand what I'm saying? I, I hear people give you just an example. They'll say, um, my wife and I got a divorce because we just outgrew each other. It's hogwash. A man looks for the girl of his dreams. He prays about it. He finds her and, and uh, they have a courtship and, uh, and uh, they start a family and uh, he gets caught up in work and what have you and uh, now he feels that he's just growing beyond her. Is that possible? No. Some things, some things we make our decision on, and that's it. We shall not be, we shall not be moved, regardless of how we feel. Sometimes love doesn't feel like love. Love is a principle. That's what Ellen White says. Love is a principle, it's not a feeling. Karen Carpenter, love is a feeling, love is, no. 
It's not. Love is something we do when we have to take the garbage out. Love is something we do when we have to cook when we don't feel like cooking. We have to change baby diapers when all members of the family get the flu. It's still love. It doesn't feel like it. So what I'm saying, trying to tell you is never do we change the recipe for Christian godliness. You don't change it and say, well, we've outgrown that. <laughs> a family came to me one time that were on the church books in the Northwest, in a church I pastored, and they had the tragedy, their daughter had taken her life, and they wanted to use the church that they no longer attended, but they were still members there. They wanted to use the church for the funeral. And it was a horrible thing. And they said, we want you to perform the ceremony, but we don't want you to talk about God, and we don't want you to pray. And see, they felt they had grown beyond those things. That kind of religion is for children. It had become more sophisticated. And I said, you need God. But I can't do that. And so I said, you're welcome to use the facility, and I will be here, and I will do whatever, but I, 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 I just, I can't do that. And talk to them about the Lord. No, 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 we've moved on. So they got a pastor, they found a pastor, and the day came that um, they had the funeral. I remember I was in my study, church office, and... Uh, this pastor they had found came in and he said, I'm uh, conflicted. And I said, why, why? He says, they don't want me to pray. I said, well, didn't you know that when they invited you? Yeah, but now's the time to have the service and I don't think I can do it. I said, my friend, you've got a problem. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That's severe. That was a severe illustration. But it can happen in all of our lives when we stop growing that we can come to the place we think we have outgrown Jesus, that we have just outgrown basic Christianity. And especially those of you who are going to secular universities when you get into the history and you get into the science classes and you are told that God did not create the earth in seven days and rest on the six days and rest on the seventh. No, the, the, the Bible's still true. The B-I-B-L-E is still the word for you. And don't grow beyond it. Embrace the cross of Jesus and his book. Beware, Peter says, lest you fall from your secure position. Now in Proverbs 16, 18, it talks about what causes us to fall. What is that first word there? Pride. Pride comes in a number of ways, you know. There are, there are different versions of pride, and we're told pride goes before fall, or pride goes before destruction. In the King James, he uses the word destruction. But as commonly, that's translated in most of our minds as pride goes before fall. Obadiah 3, only one chapter in Obadiah, says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived you. He's talking to each one of us. We think we know better than God. We think that this is the exception to God's rule, and so I'm going to go ahead and do it anyhow, even though God's Spirit says, don't go there. That's where Lucifer fell. Ezekiel 28, verse 17, your heart was lifted up because of your, what, beauty. You're corrupted. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. And he was a beautiful person, the most beautiful creation creature that God had ever made was Lucifer. And he was the closest to God. But he began to think he was all that. He began to think he was God. He says, I will ascend in Isaiah 14. I will ascend. I will ascend to the highest mode. I will ascend to the throne of God. I will sit on the north side. I will be like God. Five times he says it there in Isaiah. In Ezekiel 28, verse 6, you have set your heart as the heart of God. He thought he was going to be God. And we said, well, I would never think that. Anytime God tells me in my heart what's right and where to walk, and I say, no, I'm going in a different direction, I am playing the role of Lucifer. 
I am being like Lucifer. I am trying to be God, my own God. And so we need to regularly do a self-diagnosis. Um, I go to a skin specialist when I was young. I'm fair-skinned and I got burned a lot out in the sun. Had second degree burned several times. We lived on a lake and I was just fried all the time. And, and uh, a few years ago I told I asked the doctor, I said, what should I do? Uh, should I stay out of the sun? He said, it's too late for you now. <laughs> he said, you're reaping now what you sold 20, 30 years ago. But he said, yeah, you need to always wear sunscreen, what have you, anyhow. So he showed me how I need to check myself and I need to have Sharon look at my back. And recently uh, we went to the doctor and she was there with me and she pointed out a spot and he took a biopsy and Everything's fine, but that's a self-diagnosis, you know, where you go through and he says, you look and see if things are changing. And, and we need to do that regularly as Christians. We need to go to the Lord in prayer. And as the song says, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, here I am, standing in the need of prayer. What do I need? I'm not here to find out what everybody else is doing wrong. I'm here to look at you, Lord, and uh, to tell me. What needs to be tweaked in my life? That self diagnosis we also need to surrender all to the Lord when we come to him. <clears throat> and let make sure that Jesus is number one in our life. It's that simple. Ask yourself, is Jesus number one? And I, what I watch on the internet, what I watch on TV, what I read, what I listen to is Jesus number one. And then the secret of being like Jesus is to do the recipe. And that is open my heart and say, come in. Come in, Lord, and make the decision that Jesus will be number one. Through his power and through his grace, it's possible. It's possible for us to monkey around with reasons why we're the exception. One is very popular, is to ask, yeah, I know what you want me to do, Lord, but what will my friends say? I hear this a lot as a pastor. I think of uh, an individual years ago when I was in my 20s pastoring, who I gave Bible studies to regularly every week. We had uh, our, um, an evangelistic series, a prophecy seminar, and this individual came and and we're just really having a wonderful time. And he um, said, I have learned so much. I've learned more here than anywhere else I've been. And I said, that's wonderful. I'm glad the, uh, God is, is speaking to you. What are you going to do about it? And usually what I will do is ask a person, have you considered baptism? And just, you would not believe how many folks, yes, I have thought about that. Well, tell me that. So it was with this individual. And I said, well, what do we need to do? Is there anything you don't understand? No, I understand it all. Well, should we set a date for your baptism? And this individual said, what would my friends think? And I had learned from a fellow named Wiggins, Dr. Kenneth Wiggins, I think his name is. He's an Adventist psychologist, and he wrote a book on witnessing. <clears throat> And in his book, he says, tell people at this point, and so I, the Lord brought it back to my mind, and that is, you know, quality people don't worry about what other people think about them. They just do the right thing. Can you, can, can you remember that? If you ever hear someone says, what will my friends think about me? And I thought about that when I read it. That's what my mom said to me in so many other words. You know, uh, her version was, if everybody's jumping off the cliff, then does that mean you jump too? Has anyone ever heard that? Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> and so we had a baptism. <laughs> and, and so don't let that, oh, what will everybody think about me? No, that's codependency. Here's another one. Yeah, I know that things aren't really right in my business dealings, but you know, it won't really hurt them. What they know won't really hurt them. No, do the right thing. 
Is that what Zacchaeus said when the Lord came to his house? What did Zacchaeus do? He said, oh, let me think. I've got to make a list of all these people I've cheated. And the Bible says that we do need to make right wrongs. Someone says, oh, here's another one. I need to count the cost. <laughs> no, just do the right thing again. <clears throat> here's another one. It doesn't matter what I watch on TV or the internet. Give me a break. It's just a movie. We all know that the, no, no one's getting shot. No one's getting killed or blown up. And I would never do what that girl or that guy's doing. This will be over in a moment. Does it make a difference what we put in the head? It is true, garbage in, garbage out, with brains or computers, isn't it? Well, just one last one, and that is, this, this one almost made me laugh the first time I heard it. <clears throat> God is only interested in my soul. I can do what I want to with my, with my body. Is God concerned about our bodies? What is our body? Thank you. Yes, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. 1 Corinthians 6. Our bodies are the temple of God. It does make a difference. I get this usually when I'm talking to people about health principles and, you know, diet and unclean foods and what have you. And especially in situations where people are addicted, they're grabbing for straws is what's going on. So you don't scold them, but you say, what would Jesus do? All right, 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Beware, after you do the self-diagnosis, whatever, beware lest you fall. Get back on track here. 2 Corinthians 3, 18, the very next verse says, but, don't fall, but, grow in grace. Now, what does that mean? And? in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love the word of God. It fits together like a puzzle. Look at this. First, 2 Corinthians 3, 18, okay, you with me? There it is. I'm pointing at the screen back here I'm looking at. There it is. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. You gotta look this up in your Bible when you get home if you can't do it here. Look at this. 2 Corinthians 1, 8, same words. Same, I mean, second, Peter. What did I say, Corinthians? Sorry. Have I done that before today? Yeah. Okay, you got it right. And thank you for helping me with my spell check. <laughs> second Peter 1, verse 8, and second Peter 3, 18. All right? Say the same thing. To grow in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, second Peter 3, 18. 2 Peter 1, 8, but these things, which are the eight ingredients, those eight ingredients, is the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That we begin to realize, oh, this is what it's like to be like Jesus. Suddenly, have you ever thought back at your life and you've said, I can't believe I used to like that. I can't believe I used to do that. I can't believe I had had any interest in that. That's because Jesus is in your heart now. Here they are. 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 7. You have faith. Add to that virtue. You have knowledge. You have temperance. That's control of the mind, not just not smoking cigarettes. Patience. Do you need patience? It must be a need the last day church will especially have need of because we're told in the book of Revelation that here's the patience of the saints. Yeah. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I have a feeling that the testimony of Jesus Christ encompasses these eight things. The application can be even larger, but at least these eight things we will have. Patience godliness to become like God, kindness, and love. There it is. In John 17, verse 3, the same thing is said 
believe it or not, in these short words, this is life eternal that they might know thee. To know Christ is to acknowledge, to enter in to his life and let him enter into our hearts. That they may know thee, the only true God, and me, Jesus is speaking, Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This is hours before the cross. A man's last words are very important. These are his last words, some of his, some of his last words before the cross. In the evening, the night before, probably early in the morning, he's praying this prayer to his father. This is life eternal that they might know thee. I remember sitting in a week of prayer with Morris Vinden, first time I'd ever heard him. And he pointed this out to the student body at Southern. And I remember he says, do you know what it means to know Jesus? How do you get to know Jesus when you're knowing Jesus? And then he said, how would we get to know each other? And I remember the first time Sharon called me. I was living in the Northwest, 2,500 miles away or so. She lived down in uh, Taylor's, you know, near Greenville. And so we talked to each other. For three months we talked. We talked a lot. And we got to know each other and fell in love before we even saw each other. How do we get to know Jesus? We talk to him. Prayer is bedrock when it comes to what's important in the Christian life. Do you pray daily? Do you open the day praying? We get down on our knees and have prayer. Do you have family worship? It's so important that we bring that down to the level of the children so they will enjoy family worship and pray with mom and dad to Jesus. How else did Morris Vinden say we get to know each other? He said we listen. We talk to each other and we listen. Have you ever met someone that did all the talking and you couldn't get a word in edgewise? Huh? It's not much of a conversation, is it? And so we listen. How do we listen to God? Through the study of his word. And then something else Morris Vinden said that I found to be true. Even though we were enjoying talking, there came a day, and listening to each other, there came a day when I got on a plane and took an overnight journey from Washington State, Spokane, Washington, to Greenville, Tennessee. And I was going to see Sharon for three days and then go down and spend a week with my parents in Birmingham. I never made it to Birmingham. And just the day before I was to leave, Sharon says, here's my phone. She has one of these things in, we all have now, but she had a car phone. And I called Ken Cooley and I said, Ken, I need to talk to you. And he said, be here at 9.30 tomorrow. And I asked Ken if he'd give me a call to this conference because I'd met a girl that I think I want to marry. So doing things is very important, doing things together, right? How do we do things with God? How do we do things with Jesus? Here are the three things again. We talk to him in prayer. We listen to him through his word. And we do things with him through witnessing, through caring for others. Jesus says, as you've done it to one of the least of these, my brother, you've done it to me. So when you do things for others that are acts of kindness and mercy, you're doing it for Jesus and you're doing it with Jesus. We know that time is short and that as we get close to the end of time, it's going to get harder. More than ever will we need to walk and talk and to live with Jesus. And now is the time to start practicing doing it. Don't you think so? Yeah. So Jesus today invites all of us to acknowledge him, to have his knowledge in our hearts and our minds, 
And he promises that if we do these things, we will what? Someone help me. He says, if you do these things, you will never what? Fall. A little louder. If you, I'm going to do a hassing on here. If you do these things, you will never fall. fall. That's what he said. Can you believe it? Absolutely. Let's sing our closing song, which talks about doing the same thing, and that's Christian growth, and that is number 627 in the hymn book. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher, higher. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Number 627. Shall we stand, please? Before the benediction, I would like to say a couple of things to you. About 50, <clears throat> perhaps, of our members are not here today. They have their meeting over at TCA, Tri-Cities Academy, and uh, they're looking at church growth principles and doing some planning and what have you that they'll bring back to us to look for discussion at a future date. And I'm sure they wouldn't mind if you want to mosey over there this afternoon and be a part of it. Uh, in fact, it was mentioned last week you could have come this morning too, but we knew a number were not able to get that message or could not. But if you want to go to TCA this afternoon and see what's up, I'm sure they'll bring you into it. Also, uh, this is an opportunity to hear Barbara O'Neill down at the Thomasville Seventh-day Adventist Church. Well, it's, they're not meeting in the church, but that's all in the bulletin where Unity United, I... Sharon and I went and heard Barbara O'Neill. In fact, we were coming back from, a, from vacation. And uh, I said, where would you like to go to our next vacation, Sharon? This is right after I retired. And she says, I want to go to Australia. I said, Australia? Well, I looked on the internet, $3,000 for each of us for a round trip ticket. And that doesn't include, it. anyhow. I got on the internet and found out Barbara O'Neill was going to be in two weeks in Alabama. Australia, Alabama, we went to Alabama. <laughs> and it was quite pricey, though, to do a week with Barbara, but it was, we got, we've more than gotten our money back in health benefits. She, we did not know, initially was a Seventh-day Adventist. We found her on the internet. 
and listen to her. But this, ad, this week she's going to be, and it won't cost you anything, down there at the Thomas, Thomasville. Uh, throughout the day, I'll probably be able to, to go in the evenings uh, when we're not doing things, church things. But I just want to, again, reinforce that. Shall we pray? Father, we want to be like Jesus. Oh, please, Lord, in our growth, I pray, Lord, that uh, you will have complete sway of our hearts and our minds. May the character of Christ be perfectly reproduced in each one of us so that we will become the loving, lovable Christians that are contagious. And now I pray that the Lord will bless and keep you until we meet again. In Christ's name, amen.